St. Lidwin of Sheetham by George Carl Husemans, Chapter 6. Up till now, it was principally her mother who attended Lidwin, but Petronil fell ill in her turn, worn out by the age and the cares of an existence which was always striving to make both ends meet in her poor household. The fatigue which Lidwin's infirmities caused her, and the grief which she felt at seeing her pestered by gossip and lies, and abused even in her bed, finally proved too heavy. She took to her bed and did not again leave it, but was conscious, and, knowing that she was dying, she trembled to recall the follies of her youth, with its acts of weakness and hours badly employed. Perhaps she reproached herself with having been too hasty with her daughter. In any case, she confessed her fears to her and begged her to obtain mercy from the Savior. Lidwin, who wept bitter tears while listening to her, consoled her as best she could, and promised to gratify her as far as might be possible, through the merits acquired by her long sufferings. She made this sole condition, that the dying woman should resign herself to, le to this life and abandon herself in all confidence to the indulgent tenderness of her judge. Petronil, who knew that funds of grace her child possessed, was reassured and passed away in peace. But Lidwin, persuaded that she now possessed nothing, since she had given all to her mother, hastened to make up for her loss. She sold the furniture and the clothes that she could do without, and distributed the money to the poor. Then she decided that the bed was too soft, and sold it to her nephew and niece, who were installed as her nurses. She then ordered them to lay a plank, taken from the side of a barrel, on the damp floor of her room, and to cover it in straw. And this straw, which quickly became an abominable dung heap, was henceforth her sole bed. The task of moving her was, in spite of all their precautions, a terrible one. They had to bind her up in order that she may not break into pieces, and in raising her up they were forced to tear up the flesh which adhered to the sheet. She felt that even this was not enough, and in order to rub the skin raw, she obtained a belt of horse hair, which she never took off. She was then 28 years of age. Winter set in, a winter so long and so intense that the oldest people never remembered to have endured one like it. It became known as the Great Winter, and Thomas A. Kempe says that all the fish perished in the frozen waters. Now in this shivering season, she lived in a room without light and without air, deprived of fire, clad simply in a little woolen shirt spun for her by the sisters of the Third Order of St. Francis at Sheetham, and wrapped in a bad blanket, even though her wounds and her dropsy rendered her more sensitive than others to the cold. At night she wept tears of blood, which froze on her cheeks, and in the morning they had to detach these stalactites from her face, rough and blue with frost. As for the rest of her body, it was almost paralyzed, and her feet were so stiff that they had to rub them and wrap them in warm cloth to reanimate them. She continued, however, to live in this state worse than death, and there was rarely a sou in the house. The, the few charitable persons who helped her until then now forgot to do so. She no longer had enough linen to dress her wounds, and she would have died of misery and cold if a Franciscan of the name of Werenbold, a native of Gouda, who was for several years rector and confessor of the Sisters Tertiary of St. Celia of Utrecht, and gen Minister General of the Third Order of St. Francis, had not come to visit her. They knew each other by a vision they had both had at the same hour of the same day, when they were celebrating the Feast of the Annunciation. And from that moment, this priest, who was a veritable saint, had des decided to see her with his own eyes. He undertook the journey for this purpose, and found her in such distress that he burst into tears and was not able to speak. He gave her all he possessed, thirty Dutch pieces, that they might, at any rate, buy her a pair of sheets, and, indignant at the hard hardness of the heart of the people of Sheetham, he mounted the pulpit and reproached them in such a way that several persons, whose zeal for this work of mercy had cooled, repented. And this good Werenbold did more than assure her of the necessaries of life. For some time, he continued the lessons of Jean Pot, and pointed out to her the mystic way. He was a clever strategist in divine warfare. 
He knew how potent a fertilizer suffering is for the flower of the soul, and he admired the loving wisdom of blessed Tortinaire, who always arranged that the griefs which he could not prevent should have changed without delays into joys. There must have been some singular conversations between these two elect, and if one may believe Akempe, they talked chiefly of their death. Werenbold hoped to be summoned to the future life after Easter, but his companion undeceived him. She assured him that he would linger until Whitsuntide, and indeed he died in the year 1413, on the vigil of the feast on St. Barnabas Day. He, too, was a prophet, declaring that she must resign herself to endure yet a long time her lamentable fortune, for there remained as much for her to undergo as she had already suffered, and she survived him, indeed, for twenty years. She was present in the spirit at this agony. On the day when he died, the sisters tertiary of Sheetham announced to Lipman that they were setting out for the Utrecht in order that they might have news of Werenbold, whom they knew to be very ill. Make haste, make haste, said she, and throwing back her head, she let them understand that they would be too late. When they reached Utrecht that evening, they knew by the tolling of the bell that the saint had not deceived them. After the death of Petronil, her husband, old Peter, his son Wilhelm, and his two children, Petronil and Baduin, relieved each other in tending Lidwin, but there was a great lack of skill now that the mother was gone. One accident after another occurred, which afflicted the poor saint still further. Her father's sight was failing. During the great winter, he had the great toe of his right foot frozen and had been obliged to give up his post as night watchman. This caused a return of black poverty. He would not, from delicacy of feeling, consume any of the alms which his daughter received, and so he lived on only scraps and odds and ends. At this time, Duke William the Sixth, Count of Holland, passing through Sheetham with his wife, the Countess Marguerite, and several persons at the court, heard talk of the poverty of the saint's father. He had compassion and said to the old man, How much does it cost for you to live here? Name the sum and in consideration of the virtues of your daughter, I will pay it to you. Pierre assured the Count that twelve French crowns a year would amply supply his needs. William paid them at once, considering that the request was too modest, promised to double the amount if it became necessary. This money was at first faithfully paid, but as generosity very easily tires, especially with rich people, the good man at last received nothing, and did not think that he had the right to claim anything. Meanwhile, whilst he was profiting by his short spell of good fortune, he wished to gratify his desire to frequent churches, which he had never been able to realize for want of time. But he was nearly blind, and so weak on his legs that the slightest touch upset him. Then, when he was out, Lydwa nearly died of anxiety. She had reason to be uneasy, for they picked him up one day, nearly suffocated. It was Whitson Eve, and Pierre had left the house to go and hear Vespers, when he met a man who proposed that they should take a walk outside the town till the hour of the office. He agreed, and they went as far as a place called Dom Lane, conversing together. There he felt tired and stopped, whereupon his companion caught him round the waist, threw him into a deep ditch full of water, and disappeared. He was drowning when a carter, coming along the road, saw him, extricated him from the mud, and brought him back in his cart to his daughter. She indeed thought him dead, and was weeping for someone who had seen the old man stretched motionless in the cart, and had come in a haste to warn her that they were bringing back her father's corpse. This adventure, to which the biographers assign a diabolical origin, so terrified the saint that she devised all kinds of means to keep old Pierre at home in the future. But, having become a little childish, he escaped directly, he felt that he had, was not being watched, and he never left the house except to go to church. His daughter had not the courage to reprimand him. Indeed, he was more in an anxiety than a help to her, and his son William does not seem, in spite of his good nature, to have been much more apt than Pierre in looking after Lidwin. He it was who nearly roasted her alive. One morning, before going to work, he went into his sister's room to assure himself of the state of her health and put a candle which he had lighted on a shelf above his sister's head. Then he went out, leaving her alone in the house, for the father was also out hearing mass. Now the candle fell over, and set fire to the straw on which Lidwin was laid. 
She was meditating on the passion of our Lord and did not perceive it at first, but the crackling of the straw roused her from her trance, and it was only the hand which she could move, the left hand, which she pressed on the flames and extinguished them without being burnt. When her father returned, she no longer lay on a bundle of straw, but a heap of ashes. This brother, who was so imprudent, appears to have been an excellent man and devoted to his sister, but was married, unfortunately, to a foolish and wicked woman, who believed she had the right to do anything she wished, probably because she gave her children to Litwin's service. The saint endured her without complaint the foolish gossip and ill-judged remarks of this virago, who could not open her mouth without bawling and indulged in paroxysms of shouting for no apparent reason. But if Lidwin took all these trials quietly, others found it more difficult to accept them, as, for instance, the Duke of Bavaria, who came to Sheetham to consult the saint on a case of conscience. The crimes which he had committed and the aposty which he made in putting off his bishop's robes in order to marry no doubt tormented him. He had himself announced under a borrowed name, but Lidwin, divinely warned, was not deceived. Hardly had he sat down by her when the woman entered and stunned him with her foolish remarks and cries. He was much annoyed and said to Lidwin, How can you endure this harpy? When she is here, it must be impossible to live in this house. And the saint answered, smiling, Monsignor, what would you have? It's a good thing to suffer the impertinences and weaknesses of such people, were it only to correct them by patience and to teach oneself not to get irritated. Being a practical man, the duke hit on another solution. He bought the woman silence for the time being, and, delighted to pocket the son of money, she remained quiet whilst he was there. Lidwin's nurses were, indeed, not worth very much. The father was more of an encumbrance than a help, the brother was busy away from home, his wife was insupportable, and there remained only the two children, Baduin and Petronil, who happily did not resemble their mother, and were much attached to their aunt, but were too young to be much of an assistance. Besides, owing to the nature of the sick woman's infirmities, she could only be decently tended by a woman. God watched over her. Some pious neighbors made themselves responsible for dressing her wounds and changing the linen, amongst whom figures of a woman who was an intimate friend of Lidwin's and appears often in her history. Who was this Catherine Simon, whom we have already seen near Lidwin, when she was kept constantly in sight by the six soldiers, and who ended by living with her altogether. Gerlach calls her Catherine, wife of Major Simon, the barber. Brugman describes her sometimes as a servant, sometimes as a widow, sometimes as the faithful companion of the saint. Thomas Akempe speaks of her as a woman of quality, and says she was not the wife or widow, but the daughter of Sir Simon, whose profession he does not mention. Are these Catherines and these Simons one and the same? One of the translators of Akempe distinguishes between two different Catherines, the one of a daughter of a Simon and the other a widow of someone unknown. In any case, it is certain that this woman loved and cared for Lidwin as a daughter, and that she had to endure from the curé of Shedham, the man of the Capons, who did not forbear to persecute the saint in the most atrocious manner.